Hello, History 363. So we left off uh, yesterday, or the last video, with the Battle of the Agati Islands in 241 BC. The Roman fleet smashes the Carthaginian fleet, sinks them to the bottom, so that now we're recovering many of the naval rams and ballast and the supply amphora from the battle. Um, and this military action effectively ends the war, because now the Roman fleet uh, severs the supply lines between Lilybaeum uh, and, uh, and Carthage. Um, now, a treaty is negotiated that allows the Carthaginian army, commanded by Hamilcar, to return back to Carthage. Um, in addition, the uh, Carthaginians have to pay the Romans an indemnity. Um, that is, every year they need to make a, a cash payment in silver. Um, and the, the goal is to uh, somewhat, probably not completely, recompense uh, the Romans for the cost of the war. And the Romans, uh, the Carthaginians now have given up Sicily, um, and the Romans uh, now uh, effectively control, it's unclear how much they directly occupy or administer, but they control and claim um, uh, what, uh, what had been Carthaginian Western Sicily. Um, now, one problem with the Carthaginians, they are uh, bankrupt from the war, uh, they're pressed by the need to pay the Romans this indemnity, and they do not have enough money to pay their discharged mercenaries, um, particularly not in all in one big mass, uh, massive payment. Um, uh, so they bring their mercenaries back to Africa, and the mercenaries are sort of uh, kept in a camp while the Carthaginians uh, f try and fail to find the money to pay them. And after a while, the mercenaries get impatient and they mutiny. Um, and this leads to a terrible, terrifying war um, in which the Carthage comes very close to being destroyed. Because not only are the, the, the mutineers, these mercenaries, who basically had been the Carthaginian army, not only are they a very dangerous, armed, angry force, but a number of the Libyan subjects, remember Carthage is a, is a city-state, um, but there are a lot of non-Carthaginians, uh, native Libyans, who basically have been subjects of the Carthaginian Empire, um, who, when given the option of throwing their support behind these mercenaries and upending the status quo, um, I think that might not be a bad idea. So um, a, this mutiny basically also turns into a Libyan rebellion, um, and it is touch and go. Again, it, it, had the Carthaginians, you know, things gone a little bit other way, it's, in, it's possible to imagine the city being taken, uh, its inhabitants, uh, you know, chased out or enslaved or slain. Um, as it is, the Carthaginians are just barely able to defeat the mutineers in a, a, a brutal battle. Again, the war is oftentimes called the Truceless War for the refusal of either side to give quarter. Um, and it's not uncommon for captives on both sides to be uh, brutally executed, um, either through crucifixion, which seems to be a Carthaginian specialty, um, uh, or um, uh, supposedly by uh, uh, having uh, the Carthaginians also like to trample captured uh, mutineers uh, with their war elephants, a, a terrible form of massacre. Um, now, the general who barely leads Carthage through this crisis is Hamilcar, Hamilcar Bark, who had been one of the best generals uh, of the First Punic War, the energetic commander of Western Sicily. Um, now, during this war, um, the uh, Romans initially show a little bit of sympathy to the Carthaginians um, and even offer a bit of di diplomatic support uh, in their, uh, as the Carthaginians throw everything they've got at the mutineers. But then there is a uh, mutiny in Sardinia, a mutiny of other Carthaginian mercenaries who are part of that garrison. Um, and the mutineers invite Roman intervention. And here, Roman policy suddenly changes. And again, one reason that Roman policy can conceivably change is it's one, you know, envoys coming to the Senate may get one answer, but it's not impossible that a, uh, you know, someone calls an assembly, a consul or a tribune of the plebs, and, uh, and that assembly gives a different answer um, or pursues a different policy. Um, and so therefore, the Romans shockingly engage in a shakedown of Carthage at its darkest moment. Um, they threaten war um, and may even engage in a formal declaration of war um, unless Carthage uh, engages in a second surrender. And Carthage has no choice. Again, so locked in this death struggle with the mercenaries, Carthage has no choice 
but to basically accede to Rome's new shakedown demands. And those demands are giving Rome, Sardinia and Corsica, um, uh, two very long-standing Carthaginian possessions. Sardinia itself is seen as a, as a breadbasket, a big grain-producing island in the, in the Western Mediterranean. Um, and also, the Romans further increase the indemnity that the Carthaginians have to pay them. Again, this is a shakedown, pure and simple. Um, and it, at least for some Carthaginian policymakers, this really scars them. Not only did they lose the First Punic War, but Rome uh, uh, dishonorably, you might even say, many people would say dishonorably um, uh, uh, exploits them in their moment of uh, darkest and direst uh, need. Um, uh, now, the person who seems to be most shaped by this is Hamilcar. Um, having finally defeated the mutineers, um, Hamilcar um, uh, drives a new Carthaginian policy, a radical reshaping of what Carthaginian imperialism looks like. I mean, up till now, Carthaginian imperialism, which is real, has focused on, uh, again, the uh, ring of agricultural uh, territory uh, around Carthage, the Libyans. Um, uh, it's focused on maintaining a degree of control over Berber peoples, the Numidians, who live uh, in the more arid regions um, in what's kind of now uh, Algeria. Um, uh, and it's focused on controlling Sardinia, Corsica, and, and, uh, and Western Sicily, um, with maybe some kind of sphere of influence in, in Spain. Um, uh, now, this is completely shaken up, right? Sardinia, Corsica, and Western Sicily are gone. They're under Roman control now. Um, and so Hamilcar Barca decides that uh, he is going to pursue, he presumably gets the uh, approval of the Carthaginian uh, assembly uh, to do this, a new imperial policy in Spain to actually create a new territorial empire in Spain that can become the basis for a Carthaginian renewal. So he goes to Spain, he's given an, an enormous army, an extended command. He has probably over 50,000 men with him when he crosses to Spain. Um, and one person that he takes to Spain is his young son, Hannibal. Um, and Hannibal at this time is just a boy. Um, and supposedly, and this is a story that is actually attributed to Hannibal himself, a story he tells when he is later an exile in the Seleucid court, um, but that he asks his, his father, oh, daddy, can I go with you to Spain? And his father gets very serious and uh, takes him to an altar and forces him to swear an oath um, uh, to probably the Carthaginian Her Heracles, uh, Melquart, um, that he will forever be an enemy of the Romans. Um, if this story is true, um, it's, I think, a, a sign of just how, you know, seriously Hamilcar, um, uh, you know, feels betrayed by the Romans, how interested he is in, in uh, undoing the humiliating Carthaginian defeat of the First Punic War, and it seems that he transmits that anger and termination to his son, Hannibal. Um, now, that being said, uh, uh, Hamilcar goes to Spain in 337. Um, uh, he, he campaigns for roughly a decade and then is um, basically assassinated by, uh, you know, in a kind of local dispute, a reminder that not all Iberians are necessarily happy with this massive imposition of Carthaginian power in Spain, um, that command is then taken over by his uh, son-in-law, um, Hasdrubal, um, Hasdrubal the Fair. And here, I'm just going to have to stop and say, as we talk about the Punic Wars, um, I think Carthaginian nomenclature is going to drive you crazy. Um, it's, you know, Roman names are bad enough, lot, you know, the, the, the trinomena, um, but the Carthaginians use the same tiny set of names over and over and over again. Carthaginian history is studded with Hannibals and Hasdrubals and Hamilcars and 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 and, and, and often you would say, wait, which Hasdrubal is it? Um, I'll try to clarify whenever I can. But this way, this Hasdrubal, um, who is the um, uh, son-in-law of, of Hamilcar Barca, um, uh, holds the command until uh, 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 221. Um, and then he, in turn, is, is killed, and that command uh, passes to Hamilcar's son, Hannibal, who is now a relatively young man, not much older than you, um, but who has proven himself an energetic young officer. And we're told that the, uh, the way that this command uh, comes to Hannibal is the army basically elects him general, the army that is in Spain, 
and then this is ratified subsequently by the civilian apparatus in, uh, in Carthage. And indeed, this is one big difference between Rome and Carthage. In Rome, the military commanders are civil, I mean, magistrates who are elected in Rome. Um, in Carthage, where there are these two magistrates elected annually who look a lot like consuls, the Sufets, two, two of them, they're elected every year, they don't seem to have really much military function. And so generals, and, and, and the Carthaginian general is called a rob, um, generals, um, it seems they are elected, but they can hold uh, extended commands. Um, and uh, sometimes abroad, the, the constitutional mechanics seem to be sort of twofold, that the, the army kind of puts forward a general and then the civilian uh, government rubber stamps. And anyway, Hannibal is now the commander in Spain. Um, important to note, Carthaginian power in Spain is growing, and the Carthaginians are therefore getting access to very important resources, in particular silver. Spain has uh, silver mines, and this is going to be able to finance this, this whole new military buildup, um, and also Iberian manpower. Um, so those are the two ways that the Carthaginians are exploiting this new territorial empire in Spain. They are taking the money. Um, and they're also, as they defeat Italian, defeat uh, various Iberian peoples or Celtiberian peoples, they're forcing them to send troops to join this Carthaginian army, which is therefore a big mixture. It's got a core of, um, of, of Africans, mostly Libyans, um, some uh, you know some kind of Celtic mercenaries, but a, a lot of it are sort of defeated Iberian peoples who are being exploited through military service. In some ways, not all that different from how Rome exploits its Italian soaky eat. Doesn't tax them that much, but requires contingents to come and join the Roman army. Um, now, what's Rome been doing the whole time that Carthage has completely, they basically built up a new and increasingly powerful empire? Um, well, Rome has had uh, its own imperial horizon. Um, Rome actually suffers a little revolt in 241, nowhere near as bad as the, the mercenary war, the truceless war in Carthage. But the Feliscans, uh, uh, the people who live in, a, in a, a, a town called Falerii, revolt. And the Romans question a week um, and uh, force the Falerii to actually move their town. And, and Plivia sort of makes these two revolts a kind of parallel story of the Carthaginians who are sort of debased and degenerate and, and are nearly wiped out by this terrible revolt, and the Romans who are now, their power is waxing, who effortlessly um, uh, deal with uh, this revolt. Um, the Romans then turn them, their attentions to the north. Um, and I think one important thing about third century and second century Roman imperialism is where we're going to be talking about big overseas adventures to, you know, in Sicily and Spain and in Greece and Asia. Um, the focus of Roman imperialism is northern Italy. It's Cisalpine Gaul. It's the rich agricultural land of the Po River Valley. Um, and uh, uh, the Romans, this is, this is going to be the focus for the Romans um, in the interwar years. Um, uh, and uh, this warfare isn't particularly well attested. It seems to be oftentimes quite brutal um, and involves what we today might call ethnic cleansing, of actually trying to purge Celtic populations from the region so that their agricultural land can be seized and exploited by Roman settlers. Um, and a key moment in that is in 232, when a tribune of the plebs um, named Gaius Flaminius um, proposes a bill that will allow the settlement of, of Romans um, in individual homesteads, uh, weirtim uh, allotments, up in cisalpine Gaul. So rather than actually creating a kind of a colony, um, they'll just simply be given a homestead uh, and, and will remain Roman citizens. Um, uh, whereas in a Latin colony, you would actually, again, remember, give up your Roman citizenship to assume this package of Latin rights, which has many of the, the rights of, of citizenship. Um, so uh, now there is actually Roman settlement, massive Roman settlement in, uh, in Cisalpine Gaul, accompanied by military violence. Um, and this seems to, for the, for the other Gaul, I mean, this is, this is only in a, in a, in a section of, of, of the land, the so-called Agrigalicus, but other Gallic peoples realize kind of what's coming if they don't stop the Roman juggernaut. And so the Celts subsequently put together a alliance. They recruit forces 
from across the Alps, uh, including mercenaries and adventurers. Um, and they uh, uh, engage in a massive invasion of Italy in 225 BC, one that the Romans probably know is coming for at least a year or two before. Um, one consequence is in 226, the Romans sign a treaty with Carthage, basically acknowledging that the Carthaginians can do what they want in Spain south of the Ebro River. Um, now, uh, uh, the dating to 226 is a little controversial. I, there's some smart historians who've argued, argued it. It would make sense, though. The treaty seems to be advantageous to Carthage. And in what, you know, why would the Romans allow a treaty advantageous to Carthage? And clearly they've been keeping an eye on that. The, Car the Carthaginians are, are, are exploiting some really good, you know, just captured some great silver mining regions. Wow, they've got a huge new territorial empire. Um, why do the Romans all of a sudden in 226 say, hey, south of the Ebro, whatever you want to do is cool? Um, probably because they are really worried about a Gallic invasion, and they're worried that the Carthaginians might exploit a Gallic invasion. Um, uh, so, um, in, uh, 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 and, and, and as we'll see, this treaty causes some problems, because it's not entirely clear um, uh, you know, what happens to certain communities that already have diplomatic relations with Rome, but are also south of the Ebro River. And that may be in part because it's a sloppy, thrown, to get, thrown together treaty to buy the Romans some space to deal with this terrifying Celtic invasion. Um, now, the Romans deal with this through a massive military mobilization. Indeed, they go and do a sort of special census, not just of Roman citizens, but of all the Italian allies. And they produce a huge muster roll um, that suggests that there are uh, roughly 770,000 um, Roman, uh, uh, Roman uh, uh, citizens and Italian allies and Latin colonists available for service. Um, and while that number has been disputed and picked apart and modified, um, it do, is a reminder of how this you know, huge reserve of manpower is really critical to Rome in moments of crisis. Um, now, they don't mobilize 770,000. The, the size of the, of the Roman army is probably a little, uh, the series of armies, I should stress, is probably somewhat less than 100,000. Um, but still, this is a massive, massive military mobilization for what is perceived as an existential emergency, tumultuous, um, uh, 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 sorry, a tumultuous emergency. And indeed, the, the Latin uh, tumultus um, uh, actually refers to um, uh, a sort of levee and mass that has to take place if there is a Gallic invasion. Um, the, um, all right, so the, the uh, Gallic invasion comes and um, the Romans and are able to defeat it in two, uh, a particularly large battle, the Battle of Telamon in 225. Um, they crush the main army. Um, there is subsequent fighting that lasts into 222, but nonetheless, uh, the, the Romans successfully repel um, uh, the, this uh, invasion. Um, so um, what that, and of course, in some ways, this, this timing is kind of important. That means that, that in 226, the Romans don't want to do anything about Carthage. But after 222, even though the Romans continue operations in the north in a, in a big way, in, in, in uh, 218, they found two new colonies, Picentia and Cremona, um, uh, uh, that, that, that they're, they're able to deal more with Carthage um, than they otherwise would. Um, now, in 219, um, Hannibal um, begins to besiege the city, the Iberian city of Saguntum. Um, and Saguntum is well south of the Ebro, but um, the Romans have a treaty of peace and friendship um, with the Saguntines. Um, and this leads to the Romans, who, again, probably put together this kind of emergency treaty in 226, but now they say, they send an embassy, you know, we'd really like you to leave our, our Saguntine friends alone. Um, uh, Hannibal does not. He continues to uh, besiege Saguntum. Um, and then this leads to an escalating series of, of Roman diplomatic maneuvers, um, whereby they demand that Hannibal recall. They it seems to eventually demand that Hannibal even be handed over to the Romans. Um, and these escalating demands ultimately end when Carthage refuses them, prompting the Romans to uh, declare war. Um, now, there's something strange uh, that I think is worth noting. So in 229, 
Saguntum is under siege. It's a lengthy siege, but Saguntum nonetheless falls. And the Romans are, again, throwing out escalating demands. Now, the Romans could send a relief force if they really, really wanted to stop Saguntum from falling. And they do assemble a massive military expedition, uh, uh, commanded uh, both a huge fleet and uh, a, a large army, um, commanded by both consuls. And this military expedition goes against Illyria. This is the so-called Second Illyrian War. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the Illyrian Wars when we look at, at Roman imperialism in the Greek East. Um, but uh, suffice to say, there is a Illyrian king who is kind of a pirate king. Um, he's his name is uh, Demetrius of Pharos. For a while, he's kind of been a Roman, uh, a useful Roman uh, agent. Now he goes rogue, and the Romans send both of their consuls with a fleet and an army against him. And they pretty easily, uh, you know, overwhelm the Illyrians. But there's a question. Why, when, when the Romans are supposedly so anxious about Saguntum, and why, when they're, they're blustering about Saguntum to Carthage, to the point of uh, uh, increasingly ludicrous demands that the Carthaginians are likely to say no to, like, give us Hannibal, um, uh, why are they doing that when you know, it's, it's sort of bark and then the bite is sent against Illyria. Um, I actually think it's still a bit of a puzzle. Um, and indeed, you know, historians vigorously debate the outbreak of the Second Punic War. It's one of those things where there's evidence. Um, we get different narratives in Polybius and Livy and, and, and other writers. Um, uh, and, and you can still find sort of, uh, you know, historians who, you know, some will spend a lot of time arguing about the legal mechanics of the Ebro River Treaty. Um, others, uh, others will, you know, uh, in some ways kind of take sides. Was this the Romans were mongering it? Was this the Carthaginians? Um, my best guess is the Romans expect the Carthaginians to stand down in some way, which is why they don't take serious action to aid Saguntum. Um, and that's also why they said do a pretty quick and easy um, uh, sort of smash and grab raid over to Illyria. Um, they are then surprised when the Carthaginians uh, actually stand up firm. And remember, in, in, in 238, during the Mercenary War, the Carthaginians had just buckled. So the Romans may be trying to do something similar, make a series of diplomatic demands and expect that the Carthaginians, you know, even if they don't hand over Hannibal and pull their armies out of Spain, either leave Saguntum alone or uh, agree to a new treaty that somewhat is more restrictive to the Carthaginian sphere of influence in Spain. That, that may be where the Romans are going, and that gambit fails. Um, because the Carthaginians simply say, no way, we have a huge, powerful army in Spain. Hannibal at this point has probably over 100,000 soldiers in Spain alone. Um, and, uh, and so the Carthaginians stand firm. And at this point, the Romans have blustered to the point that um, uh, the, the declaration of war is kind of the logical conclusion. And this is actually, this can be a problem in both modern and ancient diplomacy, both sides in their diplomatic posturing, basically uh, 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 trash talk their way to the point where they, they have to declare war simply in order to save face. So in 218, um, uh, the Romans declare war on, uh, on Carthage, uh, and the Romans are preparing a significant offensive. The plan is the two consuls for 218, one will take an army and a fleet and will go to Spain, uh, and this will strike at this new source of Carthaginian power quickly. The other consul will take an army and fleet and strike Africa. It's a one-two punch. Um, this, is, this is actually pretty decisive Klauswitzian warfare targeting both centers of gravity of the Carthaginian Empire. Um, what is unexpected, though, is Hannibal strikes first. Um, uh, and rather than moving by sea, um, launches a land invasion, moving up across the Pyrenees, across the Rhone, and through the Alps to strike at Italy, catching the Romans badly by surprise. Um, they, they know that he's coming by the time he's about to cross the Rhone, but, but the whole invasion upends their plans for a quick and decisive war. Um, and so next time we will talk about the opening phases of the Second Punic War, um, by far the most terrible and violent and difficult war that the Roman Republic undertakes in the course of its overseas expansion.